for us to interact than when we are in Cape Town. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Uh, DM, do you want to add anything? Thank you, Chair. I think the Minister has largely covered um, okay. all the minor remarks. And given the time, yeah, I, I think we should um, just go straight into the presentation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Now, let's move on, DG. Uh, now, I, I suggest, because we've lost about 12 to 13 minutes at the beginning, if you can, because you sent us this yesterday, most of us will have looked at it by now, since we're based at home. Uh, so, so, you know, uh, can you take half an hour, no more? Uh, now, uh, stars and yourselves, well, 40 minutes between the two of you. Is that okay, members? And then members have two minutes, maximum three came to that. Is that okay? Anybody object? Just put it in the meeting chat and meanwhile, go ahead, DG, and then the South Commissioner. Thank you. Andre, thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, uh, uh, the slides are on, on the committee secretary is putting the slides up. Yeah, he's doing that. In the meanwhile, we have it on our gadgets as it were. Go ahead, please. Yes. Oh, thanks. Uh, I think that slide two, Chair, slide two just basically talks about our mandate uh, in Gary, uh, from the Constitution, from the PFM and FMA. So I'm not going to go into detail in terms of what, what we, what, what's, what's happening there. The, 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 second, the second slide, which is essentially um, will be reviewed and the recommendations out of that review will be implemented. Accelerated impetus will be the rollout of IFMS um, with the full rollout planned for 2024. Supply chain management and procurement systems will be strengthened throughout the public service with a dedicated program, a support program as well as an asset management support program. Next slide. Provided the committee with a list of the new policies or existing instruments that will be reviewed over the five year reporting period, and to indicate to the committee that we will be developing or strengthening um, in, uh, policies and strategies across all of our priority delivery areas, from tax to managing future spending growth and fiscal risk, to managing government assets and liabilities, to strengthening financial management. Public procurements. Given the limited time, uh, committee members, I will be moving directly into our APP. Um, I am now going to slide uh, 12, if I may. Um, as has already been indicated by uh, our minister, by the minister and the, the DG, uh, while we've listed up our key priority areas for 2021. A specific focus will be placed on those work areas given our current environment, including the budget process, redirecting funding across all spheres of government, managing the government's increased annual funding program, and ensuring stringent financial management is practiced um, whilst we have these emergency procurement processes that are required in these difficult times. It is also important to note that National Treasury will need to re-examine our planned work for this financial year given the impending budget cuts that will affect all departments, including National Treasury, that is required to redirect funds to the national uh, support efforts. Next slide, Program 1 Administration. Um, this program will focus on optimizing the organization, including enhancing the efficiency of National Treasury's IT platforms and systems, which are critical to the service delivery of National Treasury, attaining a clean audit, further strengthening risk internally within National Treasury, and ensuring our key assets, the employees of National Treasury, not only have access, but most importantly, utilize the continuous learning and development programs that um, will be made available. Program two, next slide. During the period 2020-2021, this program will produce 50 economic policy papers through the SA type program as part of National Treasury's economic research program, as well as completing a macroeconomic framework review. Um, committee, given our time frame, time period, um, that's been 
delegated on the fact that you have seen the presentation and read the document. I'll just highlight the key indicators. Program three, a critical program for us uh, during this uh, current time. Uh, their most critical um, indicator deliverables is uh, publishing the budget along with the division of revenue and division of revenue amendment bills. They will be promoting efficient use of state resources and critically they will strengthen the state's capacity and capability to exercise financial management and compliance oversight. Reforms will be introduced to enhance provincial and local government fiscal frameworks that will affect changes to the structure of financing of provinces and local government and may include changes to the way equitable share allocations are calculated or changes to conditional grant allocation mechanisms or rules and could include changes to sourcing of revenue to provinces or local government. Focus will also be placed on initiatives that drive investment and growth, including supporting catalytic projects and infrastructure plans at local government level. Uh, program four, the next slide is assets and liability management. In this reporting period, they will exercise oversight over designated state-owned enterprises, finance government gross borrowing requirements, minimize risk emanating from government's fiscal obligation, ensure sound management of government's cash resources, and report on the management of government's contingent liabilities. All extremely challenging in our current and near to medium national future. Program five, next slide, is delivered by OAG and OCPO, which will focus on improving governance and compliance across all spheres of government, working towards the elimination of waste and fruitless in public sector institutions, improving financial management governance and compliance across all spheres and entities and governments, and supporting capacity development in order to improve financial management execution. This is critical during this time when we have emergency procurement. Priority this financial year will be given to passing the procurement bill and ensuring all concomitant regulations and instructions are in place, as well as providing information and training to ensure that this new act will be fully implemented. Following the finalization of phase 2A of IFMS, which included the blueprint, I'm taking key stakeholders. Um, pilot and lead sites through pre-common design training to prepare them to effectively participate in the design program, the IFMS is accelerating its service delivery. The program is now moving into phase 2B, which includes the design of the common template and implementation at pilot sites. Program 6 will continue to advocate for South Africa's financial, economic and development interests in forums regionally and globally. This will include hosting an advocacy forum for the uptake of development finance, assessing the progress made on the implementation of the country partnership frameworks, and development engagement strategies in respect of our regional and global forums. Program 7, which is the civil and military pensions contribution to funds and other benefits, will ensure effective administration of pensions and particularly a focus on benefits validated, paid within liable dates, and fewer fraudulent claims in comparison to our previous year to ensure good service delivery to eligible applicants. At this point, um, the committee, I will, uh, having completed um, engaging on the performance, I will hand over back to the DG to speak to the financial um, aspects of National Treasury's um, AGP. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. I will go to slide number 20. Where the budget of the Treasury is outlined, and you can see it's growing uh, on a year on year growth of the presentation on the screen. Okay, so okay, okay, the, the chunk of our budget is essentially transfers is in, to, to South Program 7 of pensions. Slide number 22, 21. We have underspent the budget of the 
treasury mainly due to um, <coughs> decision to suspend IFMS payments to service providers until after the forensic investigation investigation initiated by the treasury was completed. And also in terms of that investigation, there were organizational related findings that are being considered with remedial action to be taken, including the strengthening of our management of our records, contract management, project management, and supply chain management processes. And also in terms of consequence management, this process has commenced with actions being taken against officials where applicable and appropriate service provider consequence management is in process. And also noted that one of the service providers has elected to approach the court. And Treasury is cooperating with various investigations currently underway. And this includes the PP, Public Protect, and the uh, and the SIU. And now that the committee is meeting now, uh, and she will provide the committee with a report on the existing and since the last presentation on IMS, including the process of considering the recommendations made by the invest forensic investigations report towards consequence management. Slide number 22 um, just basically again shows uh, the budget and, and the chunk of it uh, is obviously uh, in the program called International. Uh, in Ireland, uh, where the allocations are towards mainly funding South Africa's interest in international financial institutions, and the chunk of it obviously is to the NDB in terms of our subscriptions. Slide number 23. Um, as I said, I mean, the bulk of our time of budget transfers, as you can see in the slide. Slide number 24. Um, we have a staff complement of about uh, 1074. The proofs of filling broken positions at executive levels are difficult for us to complete this process. Um, despite some of these positions being occupied on an acting basis, there, as I said before to the committee, the appointed acting officials were placed on the basis of merit and they are performing those functions uh, effectively and efficiently. And they possess obviously the necessary skills and knowledge and uh, capabilities. And for senior management service, Ben G, which is salary level 50, which is at this level, the turnover rate is currently 28%, as was 50% as reported in the, uh, in the annual report. So, Chair, I will stop there, uh, just, uh, you know, so that we don't give. Uh, another opportunity for, for SARS to, to, to come up uh, or uh, to come to, to the committee. Uh, so, Chair, our presentation ends there and we'll be ready to take questions from the committee. Thank you. Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Chair. And we can see you. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry for the ditch. There was something wrong with my system. Uh, I could see and uh, hear everybody, but the sound could not go through. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Karin, for holding on. And, uh, uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, let us go to questions and uh, uh, then uh, responses. Uh, Alan, can you assist me in uh, identifying uh, members who want to make? Uh, I mean, uh, ask questions. Yes, Chair, me and uh, Nicola Eko will do that from the chat box. So if any member has a question, uh, they can just indicate by the chat box. Uh, Dion George is up first. Honorable George. Good morning, Chairperson. Good morning, Minister. Thanks very much for the presentation. Very interesting as usual. In the interest of time, I will really only just ask one simple question. I mean, we all know there's the COVID crisis. We all know that our finances are in a very difficult space. We know the revenue is down. We know that people are already hungry and that we really need to do things differently. And um, the last time we met, um, the minister was asked about the structural reforms that are required, especially because we're going to be borrowing money from the IMF, etc. I think we do need to know what those structural reforms are going to be because we have measures, they are temporary, and then when they run out, we're going to have a problem thereafter. 
So we need to make sure that our economy is actually going to grow. Because if it doesn't do that, everything we just see now is just pie in the sky. Um, and so allied to that, my, my, my key question here is, the minister did not speak about the state of enterprises. We've asked about those. It's been a long time. They are bottomless money sucking pits. We just throw money into them and it never stops. We can't continue this way. So what I would like to know from the minister is how are we going to have a sustainable economy and fisc going forward if we do not shut down the state-owned enterprises, money pits that they currently are? Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Honourable George. Uh, Honourable Mrolong. Uh, well, thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, during his uh, son address, um, the State President uh, made uh, uh, some commitment um, towards the establishment of the State Bank and, and the Sovereign Wealth uh, Fund. And to what extent is the, uh, or are these commitments finding expression in the APP? Two, um, and which is the final question, what is the status of the integrated financial system? And when does the Treasury anticipate implementing the project? Thanks. Thanks, uh, Honorable Mrolong. Honorable Maslamu. Uh, Honorable Maslamu. Chairperson, thank you. Um, I withdraw because I thought I would have an opportunity to speak at the beginning. I wanted us to follow the program as uh, presented to us, but it's fine now. We can continue. Thank you. You are welcome. Honorable uh, Raida. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Um, two quick questions, if I may. Uh, one is to the Minister, and that's just to ask um, if there is any indication of the timing of the emergency budget. Um, obviously, we won't hold him to it, but just an indication would be satisfactory. Um, my second question goes again to state owned enterprises, and Dr. Mukherjani was on the, uh, uh, on, on the record yesterday on the news saying that he supported the disposal of SAA um, or perhaps some of its non core assets, but that the sector must be kept alive by the creation of a new airline. Now, my question is, are we looking at another state-owned airline? Um, was that the, the intention of the comment made? Um, or was he looking at a private airline? And the reason I'm asking is because what that looks like is perhaps we looking at collapsing one airline, so going for a liquidation, um, and then rebirthing a new phoenix out of the ashes. Uh, and I'm wondering if the creditors, and particularly the staff, going to be negatively impacted by such an action. So if you can just perhaps give us a little bit more indication about that, because it certainly speaks to policy. Thanks, Honorable Raida. Honorable Peters. Hello, Honorable Peters. My Mine is a small uh, or a short one. It's with regards to the jobs fund, uh, how many jobs do you intend to create on this, uh, in this financial year? And the other one I think was covered by the Honorable Morolong with regards to the timelines for the state bank as well as the sovereign wealth fund. But I also want to know, Chairperson, on companies that were blacklisted who are still doing uh, business with government. What is the National Treasury going to do with regard to that? Thank you. Thanks, uh, Honorable Peters. Do we have other members who want to make uh, any comments or ask questions before the minister and the DG? Okay, Honorable uh, Lewis. Thank you. Thanks, Chairman. Uh, good morning, colleagues. I have just one question for the Deputy Minister and one question for the Minister. Uh, to the Deputy Minister, he made some comments in the last few days around monetary policy uh, and around the monetization of South Africa's debts by essentially printing money. Uh, now, it's, it's been the practice over a long time that 
elected politicians do not uh, tinker with or, or, or wade into the monetary policy space because that is the reserve of, of the Reserve Bank. Uh, and while the government and legislation obviously sits, it's up to the Reserve Bank to decide how to go about achieving that. So I wonder if the Deputy Minister would like to just uh, reflect on those comments and what he meant, because I, I, I was concerned to read them. Uh, and then the question to the Minister, there, there has been, as he said, a precipitous collapse in uh, government revenue. And uh, that is not as a result of the virus per se, but as a result of the lockdown response to the virus. Now, it was very clear at the beginning that lockdown was necessary and appropriate for safety and for caution. But as it is becoming clearer every day that the economic disaster caused by the lockdown is going to be probably one of the most severe, if not the most severe, South Africa has ever experienced, uh, I wonder whether the minister could comment on uh, whether he is actively pushing for uh, the, the reopening of more of the economy safely as soon as possible to get economic activity back on track, please. Thanks, Honorable Elwes. Honorable Masamu. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Um, I think the, the first question that I want to ask is uh, a little bit challenging. And uh, there's a thin line because the uh, Treasury is responsible for the public pets. And there are other uh, departments that are responsible for uh, other mandates, like the issue of the SAA. Um, we, 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 we all are aware that uh, there are groups for all these questions that we have. And uh, there's the Department of Public Enterprise that is dealing with it. Um, and if there's an argument or a decision that is going to be taken at the cabinet level, um Sajari will have to, to to fund. But um I just want us not to to mix issues. Um, I don't I'm requesting actually not to mix issues and draw draw the minister into issues that uh, are the mandate of other departments and, and are not finalized. I, I do have an interest there as well, uh, honorable rider. Um the issue of the reprioritization when we, we saw the, the, the presentation by the DG, uh, there, there was an indication that the uh, reprioritization are uh, going to be done. And uh, I might have lost it somewhere. I'm not sure. At, at, um, or they also are not uh, sure they might have not uh, finalized at which programs, which items are going to be reprioritized. Remember last week when we had a meeting, there were a whole lot of questions and a whole lot of uh, 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 clarity seeking questions where we want to understand as to where are these uh, 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 cards going to be done? Um, because obviously we're going to deal with the, the special bill. And the special bill will be dealing with funds that will be taken from other programs. And uh, we understand that, uh, I understand that um, uh, Treasury still, still might be still busy with that. And last week in the meeting, we said uh, members should, uh, through Secretariat and the Chief of um, uh, forward questions to Treasury. I wonder if those questions were. were were forwarded to, to Treasury because we had a limited time and there were questions that needed to be answered. Uh, if those questions were, were forwarded to Treasury, I would appreciate it if uh, Treasury can speak to those questions so that members can, can, can be satisfied with the questions that they asked. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, uh, Honorable Masango. Honorable Dutton. Honorable Dutoy. 
Okay, I'll come back to Honorable Joy. Honorable Karim. Thank you, Chairperson. Just very quickly, um, we received, uh, I think the chair is coming, Chair Joey would have received it too. A letter from Kosatu, Minister, Deputy Minister, DG, saying they've written to the Minister and the DG to say, uh, presumably, I haven't got a full uh, sense of it, but uh, uh, obviously, uh, right now, in the midst of the crisis, as we begin to restructure the economy, we need to focus on uh, creating space for small businesses to grow, obviously. And I think we'll have to support that. But the point is that uh, in the education sector, I don't check person, there's a need for 45 million fabric masks. And it seems Treasury has restricted its tender to only small businesses. While Kosato obviously supports small businesses, it wants to know whether that's reasonable in the circumstances. Uh, especially the need to get these masks out as soon as possible. The concern also about the textile industry that they represent and the loss of jobs uh, and so on, and this might contribute to that. I think they call for is a better balance between uh, a space for small businesses to grow, but also taking into account other sectors, uh, workers and the economy. So could the DG and the minister let us know what their response is to that, or indeed when they'll meet with the start as is agreed. Secondly, Comrade Joe, you will see there that there's about 13 pieces of legislation they mean to present this financial year. Do we expect us to process all 13 pieces? Will they in fact be able to deliver the 13 uh, bills given the pressures on them too? Thank you. Thanks, Honorable Dutoy. Let me go back to Honorable Dutoy. Honorable Dutoy, are you there? Hello, Honorable Dutoy. I think uh, is having a connection problem. Maybe you will come back on the second round. Okay, thanks. Uh, for now, let me go back to the minister and the DG to respond to the questions that have been asked by uh, honorable members. Uh, honorable minister and uh, deputy minister DG. Okay, back. Uh, Oh, you're back. Yes, sir. Thank you for, uh, for the opportunity. Okay. I apologize. Let, uh, Honourable uh, Minister, let me allow Honourable Dutoy to ask a question. Then uh, we'll come back. Honourable Dutoy. Thank you so much, Chair. I apologize for the inconvenience. Uh, I want to know with um, companies that are not PE compliant and that's not receiving assistance from government. Could the minister please provide estimated loss of revenue towards SARS as a result of a large portion of these businesses that will be closing down and that will, as a result, not be contributing to the financial focus? Thank you. Thanks, uh, Honorable Dutoy. Honorable Minister, Deputy Minister, PG, over to you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Member. I I propose that uh, uh, DG answers those questions if he can, and then DM will answer the questions. Uh, DM, maybe you should leave the question on the reserve bank for me, but you can answer if you want. And then after the two of them have answered, I will uh, come and wrap up uh, in the detail of it. So could I ask the DG first, and then the DM? And yes, any other yes, that's 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 present that's after that. that. We were actually supposed to go uh, in, straight into both presentations and then questions and answers. But, uh... yeah. Apologies. Uh, I can start. I can start. Uh, thank you, honorable members, for the questions. Over the life of the program, the Jobs Fund, uh, Minister, uh, uh, Honor Peters, the, the target remains 150,000 jobs. Uh, and, uh, so, and we can obviously give details maybe in terms of which sectors based on, on the plan, on the program, plan for the, for the jobs fund. That, that's one. The, 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 the other question is, uh, that was directly to us, which we in particular is, is around, no, actually, there's not a lot. The, most of the questions are political questions that the minister should answer. Um, in terms of uh, the question, I think 
you know, obviously SARS will give a little bit more detail in terms of the impact of revenue. So I think maybe let's wait for that particular answer from, from SARS in terms of the impact of the losses as a result of entities or companies that may close. There's definitely going to be an impact impact there. Um, there's also a question about um, no, no. I think Deputy Minister can come in in the meantime. I'm just going to put you my notes, but most of the questions are political. Anyway, this is the DM can answer it. No, no. Th thanks, uh, and, and good morning once more. On the State Bank and the Sovereign Wealth Fund, I think the question asked by Honorable Morolo and uh, Honorable Peters as well. She um, added her voice to the question. There is work going, ongoing so far as the State Bank is concerned. And I think you're right that perhaps we should just make sure that it is in the APP with clear timelines. Both projects, that is the State Bank as well as the Sovereign Wealth uh, Fund. And I'm sure when we finally put together the APP, um, those uh, projects should be in the document. Um, Honorable Lewis asked a question regarding what I said um, on the question which was asked to me during a political education session of uh, my party, the African National Congress in Johannesburg. And the question was whether I support the idea that the Reserve Bank should directly buy government bonds. And I think what I, I need to emphasize is that it is the independent responsibility of the Reserve Bank to print money or supply money using different instruments, repo rates, uh, buying bonds, um, capital adequate ratios for the bank and all that to achieve price stability in the interest of balanced economic growth. And economic growth now is unbalanced due to COVID and other pre-COVID structural constraints, which we all know, and I think uh, Honorable George uh, referred to some of them, uh, the importance of the structural um, reforms in so far as growing our economy, uh, which were there even before um, this COVID crisis. The COVID has just worsened our economic uh, situation. Now, under this situation, the Reserve Bank, as we all know, has undertaken a number of monetary policy measures in response to this crisis. Uh, the Reserve Bank has reduced the repo rate by 200 uh, basis points, and I support it even though they did not need my support to do so. The Reserve Bank, together with the South African banks, they've designed a credit guarantee scheme to support SMMEs with a turnover of less than 300 million. And I support this, and they don't need my permission to have done what they've basically done. They further decided to buy bonds in the secondary market. And all of us as government, we have supported and prodded the Reserve Bank in the way in which they are responding to this COVID um, crisis. Supporting what the Reserve Bank does and what it may do in future, it is not wrong. If Reserve Bank on their own independently decide to directly buy government bonds, I will support it. And that was my answer in that political discussion. And of course, journalists made a follow up on my um, intervention, on my answer, 
in the political discussion in my own party, the African National Congress. And I further qualify why I would support the idea of the Reserve Bank acting on their own independently without any due pressure, like I've done in supporting what they've basically done. Like I said, they don't need my permission or permission of any political uh, public representative. If they decide to buy bond directly, uh, I further qualified. I said, hey, this should be temporary, in my view, to the clear exit plan. And secondly, it should be directed to COVID health related interventions and economic recovery interventions centered around public infrastructure as well as structural reforms so that we increase our economic growth, our production, and other economic activities. In that way, this is what I said we will be in a position also to avoid inflation because injecting money into the economy and there's no production result in a situation where money chases few goods and that generate hyperinflation. So I said those are the conditions under which I will support this idea. And making a comment on an institution is different from take a decision on his behalf for influencing it. And knowing the caliber, the experience and professionalism of the people who run the South African Reserve Bank, men of integrity, very experienced, there's no way they will allow the independence of the Reserve Bank to be challenged. No, you as a committee, parliament will allow anyone to challenge the independence the operational independence of the Reserve Bank, on the instrument independence of the Reserve Bank, to realize the objectives that are clearly articulated in the Constitution. So unless we doubt the South African Reserve Bank's independence and its independence to um, do what will deemed necessary under this circumstance. I think people who have a problem with my comment, I don't think that uh, there should be an issue here uh, at all in so far as the independence of the uh, Reserve Bank. And indeed, we are in, as the minister said, living in difficult uh, times uh, which require all of us uh, within the law do all what we can to get out of this situation we find ourselves in. Thank you, Chairperson. Chair, there's also some questions that I, 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 I prefer to answer. Uh, I just went through my notes again. There's a question on um, uh, the minister will add to it, which is on the provision of masks. And uh, you know the question of consulting and so on. So you are correct. Uh, you know, you know that is correct. We, we did get the letter from Kosati, and we were supposed to uh, to meet. They requested a meeting at 10 a.m. today, uh, in terms of their communication yesterday. Uh, unfortunately, we indicated to them uh, in, 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 in a discussion between the deputy minister and them to say we will be in parliament. We will be responding to them. Um, there's, a, there's a letter that you are responding to, uh, that there's a draft letter. Chair, in terms of our letter, we, we're very clear in terms of uh, the instruction. Firstly, I think the instruction is direct in terms of what, what we are saying. Number one is we, we think it's important that um, we, 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 we recognize the rule that uh, small business should play in, in, in our economy and we should actually encourage encourage uh, small business to flourish. What we are saying in the instruction note is very clear, and, and our letter to them will say that, is that we are saying small business companies, uh, you know, small uh, SMEs must register with the central supply database. That's number I mean, with, with the small business development, number one. Number two, we're also saying that companies that have to do business with government 
should also be registered with the central supply database. And that, that, that's something that we should know who we're dealing and uh, who we're talking to. Thirdly, is that we said to departments and institutions in government, in one of the instructions that we gave, should uh, encourage, and I'm emphasizing that, encourage uh, to give preference to small data enterprises uh, in order for them not to be left out. We understand that. Uh, the demand for this master's block must going to be very high. This has to be the Department of Education is going to, uh, you know, uh, other those big millions. We are not barring any business from doing business with the state. I think that must be very clear. Whether small, big, or, or and we are not saying it's exclusively a, a small business uh, environment. Because if you cannot meet the demand, yes, they are right in that uh, in public you know, students, kids at school will be affected. But here we are very clear that and we, we, we make it very clear that small businesses need to be supported when it be. Masks are not sophisticated to manufacture. They are not. And if the quite right quality is produced with the right material as stipulated by the Department of Health and the Department of, of DTIC, yeah, that's a requirement. And if we can meet those, and we can make sure that small business people, make sure that small uh, uh, consortia of, 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 of uh, various people who can manufacture this, including cooperatives in rural areas, in townships, everywhere, let's support those. And that, I think, is the thrust of what we're trying to say. But uh, again, we will uh, engage with that very clearly, and the minister can add on to that. It was important that we actually take everyone on board and we should ensure that where possible we are able to preserve the jobs, whether it's in the textile sector or in any other sector for that matter. Because as you know, we, uh, that's critical. There's also another question on reprioritization from Oromatangu. Oromatangu, yes, insofar as the national treasury is concerned, we will have to reprioritize the numbers that are in this, in this presentation. And I think, uh, obviously, when the details are clear, if you remember, we mentioned the 100 billion coming from national department. National treasury also will have to contribute to that 100 billion rent that must be reprioritized. So details are mentioned are not available now, but when that process is complete, we'll make sure that we, we, we prioritize, uh, reprioritize, and actually make, make, make everyone aware of where we are at. There's also another question. Laura will take the questions on uh, on. Uh, IPMS and uh, the digital response that she will, she will talk to. There's also blacklisted companies. If you are blacklisted, yes, you are blacklisted. And we should, we should actually stop doing business with the state. And we will, we will ensure that that happens. Uh, because that means there's something wrong until what that your particular company, a particular company will, will transgress. So, but however, as the process is, departments, entities in government will indicate which companies to blacklist based, based on contractual arrangements, based on uh, you know, floating some of the arrangements and agreements that they, they entered into, and based on that, we'll certainly do that. Uh, and again, we, we do that on an ongoing basis, and we sometimes investigate to a point where it would be we are able to remove if, if the department or entities advise that the matter has been dealt with comfortably uh, between the two, two, two uh, entities. So we do that. And uh, I don't think there's another question. Maybe Laura, before the minister can come, Laura can just close on, on the argument and we can give it to the minister. Thank you. Um, thank you, DG. And for the committee, in terms of where we are currently with IFMS, um, IFMS is on track to implement as per the NPSF um, indicator for IFMS. Where we are currently is phase 2A has been completed, that's the architectural planning, with the output there being the IFMS architect and clinic blueprints have been completed. In terms of phase 2B, which is the common design and pilot implementation, um, we have completed the readiness assessment at the pilot and lead implementation sites. We have completed the training for the pre-common design where we held 24 workshops and trained 245 delegates on, uh, on the common design. The IFMS Centre 
excellence which will be hosted by CETA. We have complete, uh, partially completed, the, sorry, we've completed the conceptual delivery strategy and the standard operating procedure uh, for the Center of Excellence is Park achieved. And as I'm sure uh, uh, committee members know, IMS website and communication portal is now developed and is now live. The establishment of the panel for the Oracle Specialized Partners for Implementation of IFMS, that's RFB 1859 2018, is partially achieved, it's underway. The establishment of the panel for PM and related professional services, um, the terms of reference are completed and are waiting to be published. Um, the technical resources were trained on Oracle Foundation and specialists in preparation for capacitating the Centre of Excellence has been completed. And the procurement of common design services is partially achieved, achieved and currently underway. Um, and that is where we are in terms of the IFMS rollout. The one other question I wanted to answer was in terms of the number of bills we've identified um, as part of the APP. And um, just to say to the committee, um, the list of legislation is critical to the work that National Treasury does. However, we are very mindful of the challenge of our current environment and that it absolutely requires shifting of priorities. Um, that is further compounded by the expected cuts that will affect our work plan. And we will inform the committee um, in writing as to the plan, legislation, and changes if there is any. Thank you, DG. Uh, thank you. Before, before I uh, chair, before I um, uh, join the answers to the question, DG, there was a question I think from Honourable uh, Peters about the jobs fund. Uh, that you maybe want to talk to, DJ? Oh, Minister, I did answer it. I said the target there is 150,000 jobs over the life of the program, the remaining life of the program. And I said okay. if, if teachers can then be given in terms of which sectors are targeted. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, can I come in, Chair? Yes, Minister, you can come in. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, I like your library, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Proceed so that we can change us. we left this for different minutes. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, members, for. Um, your uh, most valuable uh, contributions. Let me start off with the question on structural reforms. Uh, this question has become more important, particularly in the light of the fact that uh, we might be approaching the International Monetary Fund for uh, COVID-related uh, funding. <clears throat> Uh, because uh, the debate then is, uh, are you going to face structural conditionalities from the International Monetary Fund or not? And the reason I, I say this is because you might recall, Chair, that we began to speak about structural reforms a long time ago before COVID-19. And we indicated what we're talking about. And I want to just quickly, in the interest of time, uh, just refer members back to the documents uh, that we produced uh, called uh, Towards an Economic Strategy for South Africa, uh, which was published uh, sometimes last year. So, and in that document, we sought to elaborate on what we meant by structural reforms. And I don't have time to go into it now, but I refer you back to that document. But we said amongst others that given the structural changes in the South African economy, it is very, very important that our reform agenda relates to that structural change in the South African economy. So firstly, we have to improve educational outcomes. 
so the kind of uh, educational product uh, 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 graduate uh, so on who comes out of our institution must relate to the structural nature of the economy we mentioned that secondly we said implementing youth uh, employment interventions with a high number of youth unemployment and we need to uh, intervene there we said let's uh, prioritize uh, an integrated affordable transport system we should make the flow of labor the flow of goods uh, much easier uh, in our society we said let's address the critical uh, skills shortages in particular prioritizing the, the know-how, i.e. bring into South Africa those skills that we don't have. And that we should get out of the notion that South Africans know everything, that things we don't know, and therefore high skills um, uh, importation is very important. Low skill is not important, but high skill is important. We spoke about uh, building capable states to make sure that at the apex of the state, there's ability to uh, guide uh, the state. And as we said, we need a stable macroeconomic policy framework, which will help to support these uh, initiatives. We spoke about modernizing the network industries to promote competitiveness and inclusive growth. I'm just giving you the high headlines. We spoke about the interventions in electricity, the production, the distribution, and the transmission work that's being done, including uh, bringing to play, more importantly, the independent uh, uh, producers. We spoke about telecommunications, and we made the point about the rapid deployment of spectrum. Uh, limited spectrum has not been raised. We spoke about transport, in particular, introducing competition in rail and ports, and bring into partnership with Transnet, for example, the expansion of some of our harbors and ports, like the Deben Harbor, for example, and be not afraid to bring in private uh, managers to help manage the system. We spoke about water and the importance of uh, uh, water management. We spoke about lowering entry uh, by uh, 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 reducing the power of uh, conglomerates and uh, large companies which stifle small and medium enterprises. That work is being done by the uh, Competitions Commission. We spoke about the need not to confuse competition with company regulation, over regulating and over uh, imposing competition rules without understanding the dynamics of the market can also be a problem. So, market structure understanding. Uh, it's very important. We spoke about the role of development finance institutions. We spoke about the, the dialectical relationship between regulation and economic dynamism. That the regulations that we put in place must be such that they do not stifle uh, business activity but promote it. And so on. So I urge members to revisit that document so that we have an understanding about. But our understanding uh, of uh, structural reforms are, and we, I end up by saying this, end up this component by saying that uh, we also said that there are low hanging fruits at that time. And the low hanging fruits was agriculture and tourism. Unfortunately, tourism is now suffering, but agriculture is still there. And we need, therefore, to get on with the support for agriculture, big, medium, and small uh, farms. And we must also not be ashamed, and I've spoken to the Minister of Agriculture about this, we must not be ashamed to utilize those large number of farms which might be under the land bank uh, book, uh, utilize them as state farms. There's nothing wrong with having state farms because so many unemployment employed youngsters who can be absorbed into state farms and the farm at some stage, if one of them decides to apply to uh, buy the state farm, 
can buy the state farm, but we can't have agricultural land that's idling in the country. That's an important part of the structure of reforms as well. Now, this is totally different <clears throat> to the classic IMF structural reform programs. So we must not confuse the two. So we are talking about our own structural reform program to promote economic dynamism uh, in our economy. The second question, uh, Chair, very quickly. Um, for state-owned enterprises, I think uh, uh, Member Matlangu there rescued me to say that maybe this is a question that you need to discuss when you meet with the uh, um, uh, um, Honorable uh, Gordon. Uh, but let me say that uh, the, the Minister of Finance is no longer interested in funding um, uh, defunct state-owned enterprises. Um, we're no longer interested, really, in uh, pouring public funds into dysfunctional state-owned enterprises. Uh, but we are uh, interested in supporting those state-owned enterprises which uh, um, are functioning very well, as you know. The state is a significant shareholder in telecom, so you know, uh, we fully support them. Give us a dividend, which we appreciate very much. And there are state of and enterprises which are fixing as well. I'm personally biased as a support for Janelle, as a manufacturer for both the domestic market and international market. Janelle uh, has the capacity to help in the further transformation of the military industrial complex, converting to the military into civilian use, uh, and it's a very important area supporting our engine and so on. So I, I support Dinel, but I must put that business case uh, up and running uh, uh, properly. So I think that and the State Bank, I think the Minister has Issues raised by the honorable member about lockdown issues. 
uh, I couldn't agree more with you that the quicker we are able to uh, reach level two, uh, the better. But at the same time, we must not be careless about it because we have to balance the needs of the economy with the health status of our people. So I think that uh, the National Community Council uh, would make the most appropriate recommendations to the cabinet uh, from time to time on what we do to open up the economy. There's no doubt in my view that uh, uh, opening the economy is urgent, but the agency must be tempered by the need to protect the lives of our people. Uh, so we need to have a balance. It's not an either or situation, but a balanced situation. Um, and we will remain uh, seized with the matter in this regard. Uh, as far as the matter relating to a letter from COSAT, um, well, we receive many letters, by the way, uh, honorable members, not just from COSAT, but from a whole range of uh, sections of our society. Uh, maybe some of their letters don't get as much prominence as the ones from Kosat. But we appreciate the interaction that we have with all of society, uh, Kosat included. And uh, they raise an important question <clears throat> in this letter that uh, there must be no impression given that we are excluding large companies uh, from uh, doing business in South African society. But neither should there be any impression given <clears throat> that we should not support small and medium enterprises. As you know, small and medium enterprises are sometimes referred to as the hidden champions in any economy. So therefore, I think as the DG said, we take a balanced view. Uh, the large companies which can produce the most sophisticated whatever of this health uh, gear, I'm sure they should do that. Um, but also the support for small and medium enterprises. But I want to get into the, the thought process, the mindset change. Um, I bought uh, uh, 10 masks from Bigasdor last week. Young African woman, Mrs. Malaji, produces these masks. I bought 10 of them because there's 10 of us here um, um, at my place here where I stay. So, and so I bought them, 20 rand each. She's not even a micro enterprise, she's just an individual enterprise. And those people need support. And she might be able to sell to many other people. Those people are not waiting for the government to buy those masks for them. The notion that the masks are only going to be bought by the government, by the central terror system, it's wrong. We should go out and buy the masks where we can afford it. And parents who have children going to school, well, if they can afford the mask, they should buy the masks from Tigers or wherever. Uh, so that both big and small and micro and individual enterprises are part of this. But the notion that only the state is going to buy, I think, must be discarded. So we'll discuss with Kosat to, I'm sure, we'll come to a uh, common understanding. Honorable Doctor, this is a very vexing question. Um, yesterday, I had a conversation uh, with the, the owners of the Mahuba School of Hotel, because I wanted to understand that they're coping in this time, because as you know, Mahuba School of is mostly a tourist area. We saw the restaurants and the Mahuba Sloof Hotel, Mahuba Sloof Rest Camp, uh, uh, Glen Shill, and others. This place is dead. It's a tourist area. So I want to find out what's happening because I noticed that uh, you now we have started a food delivery system. And so it says, look, his business is about 130 million annual turnover on a good year. It's a medium-sized enterprise. He says that 95% uh, uh, of the staff there is black, um, including the chief um, uh, uh, maintenance uh, manager. 
Uh, he says, for all intents and purposes, except that his own is white, this enterprise, the Makuba School Hotel, actually supports uh, many South Africans, uh, black and white. He says, now, the hotel is closed. There's no income. He has applied for uh, no income support from his insurance company. They have not responded. Uh, the banking sector is not responding very well to him. Uh, he says he understands that the government can't help him as well because he's white. I, th I thought I said, I think you're wrong there. But he says, no, no, no. Uh, you, you must go and speak to the Minister of Tourism. I said, no, it's not true. You have misunderstood me. But anyway, I'll be having a conversation with the Minister of Tourism. I think that uh, we need to support all enterprises, black and white, uh, as long as they are able to remain uh, viable to support our people, create jobs, um, and let's continue to build this non-racial South Africa of our dreams. And so Deploy, I can't support a policy position that you would claim discriminates against, say, the owner of the Mahfouz Hotel because he's white. So we put together work together. Yes, there, there would always be a bias towards emerging black uh, business people because they were discriminated against for a long time. But let's pull together and build a South Africa of our dreams, non-racial, non-sexist, and democratic and prosperous. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, uh, Minister. Can I take uh, Honorable Peters after the presentation by uh, uh, the Commissioner uh, because we are running out of time by the next uh, 30 minutes, we should be done. Uh, Honorable Peters. Okay. Can I take you? Can you be the first after the presentation by the Commissioner? Because I see here you want to make a follow up, and I realize that we are running out of time. No, thank you very much. I, I will talk after the Commissioner. Okay. Thanks, Honorable Peters. Uh, Honorable Commissioner, can you present in the next uh, seven minutes? Uh, can you please be done so that we can have uh, another uh, 28 minutes for questions? It's just that we have got limited time and the parliamentary program is tight. Thanks. Uh, Commissioner Keitita, uh, can you present? Okay, I think it's unfortunate that we, we run out of time, but I will focus on a few slides only. Uh, I accept that uh, we have submitted two documents, the strategic plan as well as the, um, the uh, annual performance plan. Of course, the APP will be significantly impacted uh, by the current circumstances. So I will basically just remind members of the SARS mandate, uh, which is... Uh, Drafts in law on page three and on page four. I think the work we have done is to translate um, the mandate into nine clear strategic objectives. This is our condition. If we do this well, uh, we'll fulfill the mandate. You will notice at, at the bottom of every slide, I have uh, indicated a cross reference uh, to the documents that we have given you. Um, I want to go to slide. 60 slide 7 where I uh, address the um, the uh, current situation. Um, on slide 8, basically we have an extensive um, adjustment to our working arrangements um, and in support of uh, the spread of the lockdown as well as improving uh, the uh, Social distancing, uh, we have done a number of adjustments to our work arrangements. Uh, you'll see that um, we have had most people work from home. Uh, we will adjust that and uh, increase our staffing levels from about uh, mid 15% uh, to the high 20%, uh, around 30%. Um, and we will progressively, as we um, improve the conditions of our workplace for social distancing. Uh, we will improve the um, um, the arrangements that work. I'm not going to go into the detail. Suffice to say that we have used the crisis to 
fast track the modernization journey of SARS. We have stepped up the work to improve um, our digital offerings, uh, and we have coached in the last uh, six weeks many more of our taxpayers to engage with us digitally, and we have managed our branches on an appointment system only. Um, I can give you more detail of that, but suffice to say we have had three visits. Uh, visits have three of our offices already by the Department of Labor, and have left um, feeling com confident that we have made the necessary arrangements to ensure that our staff are safe and that we are honoring the public health uh, and social distancing measures as well as the occupational health measures. What I would like to um, go to is to slide um, 14 revenue implications uh, because I'm sure there's a lot of uh, interest in that. Uh, in, in regard to that, um, I, I also just need to say that uh, given the on, um, on uh, only uh, essential and permitted goods. We've also had to make sure that our custom officers are well protected um, whilst they are able to um, engage with travelers, with, with their traders, uh, as well as uh, ensuring that the goods must come through um, are facilitated legally, uh, because even in a time like COVID, we are not left of the hook uh, in terms of um, the, uh, in terms of uh, the criminals trying to still get their pound of flesh. I will go to the slide that says revenue implications. There are three important points I want to make there. The first is the impact of COVID. Um, that is um, the slide that says the three things that we focus on is reduced economic activity, the cost of the relief measures, the general state of our economy, um, as well as our concern around compliance. Um, so if I can go to each of that, uh, there's a list of measures that is um, in the presentation. I'm not going to touch on that now. Suffice to say that we've had to work quite hard because it is up to SARS to administer those measures uh, and ensure that the integrity of the disbursements and access into those measures are done a high level of integrity and to ensure that there's no abuse. We've already seen early signs of abusers trying to get access to these measures. And so we had to step up the work um, that ensures that we can manage that with integrity and efficiency. Um, in terms of uh, communicating with our public, uh, slide 17 will show you the COVID relief measures uh, that we've communicated by empowering uh, education on our website through YouTube uh, messages, through clarification notes, through website messages, in order to help taxpayers understand our obligations. What is very important, uh, members, is that even during this time, we must ensure that taxpayers remain compliant. More than ever before, government needs revenue. Taxpayers need us to administer refunds. Um, and so we've had to ensure that the essential activities of SARS um, are continually uh, even effective. Um, slide 18 gives you just a view of the cost of the measures. It's a table that says cost of tax measures. Um, and you can see there that the initial estimate is 70 billion. Uh, our own early evidence suggests that it would be higher than that because there's a case by case application for deferral of payments. Uh, and we expect that to swell significantly beyond the 5 billion that is indicated on that. If I move to the next slide, um, that basically is the slide that um, uh, Treasury provided in terms of the view of the economy. Uh, and you see the range of between 5 and 15% um, that would be the impact of revenue. I'd like to give an update to that based on the first month that we have. We think that it is, while it is early days, our revenue losses could be anywhere between peaking at between 15 and 20 percent lower, and that translates into a revenue loss of up to 285 billion. Um, that is a function of the sluggish economy, but also the impact of lockdown, which the concerns I'd like to raise there. So we do not get into the politics or necessarily the rationale behind the decisions of lockdown. 
our day job is um, domestic resource mobilization, so we raise concerns only in respect of that. There are three concerns that we, we raise that will impact on that. The first concern is the significant reduction in economic activities will have a short-term revenue implication. The second is the more longer-term concern is the impact on the economic capacity uh, that is lost. We believe some of these businesses will never come back again. Uh, once they go out of business, many of the jobs lost will never return. So our big concern we would like to flag to the committee is the loss of economic capacity. Um, it takes probably 100 businesses with high income mortality rate to create one successful business. So for every business we lost, we will have to have 100, if not more, entrepreneurs to take the risk and to create new businesses. And the third risk is the increase of illicit uh, economy. And we have uh, clear evidence that the illicit uh, and criminal economic, eco economic activities uh, are thriving. A quick deep dive in terms of the revenue impact through the major tax type, we see in the first month as you earn is down by 5.2% compared to prior year, um, that over 65,000 employers who made payments in April made no payments uh, in uh, this year um, to a tax value of 3.8 billion. We also see over 87,000 employers who made payments in April last year made payments that are lower to a tax value of 6.1 billion. In terms of domestic VAT, we see a month on uh, month, month uh, decline compared to last year of 4.3%. And basically, we have seen that. Um, a decrease of 13% of from 160,000 vendors last year to only 139,000 vendors this year. Uh, and of the 139,000 vendors, only 105,000 vendors um, paid um, uh, an amount uh, of, of um, equivalent to last year, to prior year. And that 75% of the vendors uh, contracted in terms of the contributions, which obviously shows a significant strain in terms of the consumption patterns uh, in the economy. Um, import taxes, we have seen a, uh, a decline of 19.7%, made up of import VAT down 25%, a tax value of 1.6 billion, and customs duty down by 11.8%, a tax value of 100 million. In terms of specific excise duty, uh, month uh, uh, last year to this year, we are down 54.7%, a tax value of 1.3 billion. Uh, it was 1.7 billion um, on alcohol and cigarettes, offset by a 400 million upward correction in fuel levy, levy uh, bringing us to a tax loss of 1.3 billion. Um, and we are continuing now to see the request for payment deferrals in those sectors. Corporate taxes, April is not a significant month, but we see a 55% um, downward comparison based on last year, this year, uh, last year compared to this year. Uh, VAT refunds, we've also seen a 12.5% lower than estimate, uh, and that is uh, primarily due uh, to uh, the number of credit returns that have been submitted by taxpayers. Um, and uh, and so we suspect that uh, the downward trend in revenue refunds is just a reflection of the activity in the economy. Um, I think I would like to uh, just share with you that in the last few days, uh, our illicit trade unit visited a cigarette manufacturing plant and came across three of the machine lines being actively producing. They intimated that they are producing for exports, but cigarette exports at the moment is not permissible. Uh, we are working with the South African Police Service to lay, investigate, and potentially lay charges. We have also uh, intercepted a vehicle um, purporting to carry food, but instead when we opened it to carry alcohol, uh, we have discovered uh, three separate storage units warehousing illicit alcohol. Just the other day, um, I saw a, um, a little um, delivery guy smoking a cigarette. I went to him and said, you know, my friend, may I have a cigarette? 
and so he said, I can give you one. So I said, no, no, I want to buy some. And he said to me, well, if you just go down the road, uh, there's a garage, there's a guy, if you ask him, you will be able to buy cigarettes from him. So we raise those concerns uh, so that I think as we uh, proceed on a risk-based approach uh, towards opening up the economy, uh, the decision makers are mindful of the short-term impact on revenue, but more importantly, the two concerns I register, which is a permanent loss of economic capacity, which will take years, if not decades, to restore, and a rising economy. I will pause there, Chair. Okay. Okay. Uh, thanks, Commissioner. That's the presentation by the uh, SARS Commissioner, uh, Honorable Members. Uh, the first to ask question or make a follow up will be Honorable Peters. Can I note other members who want to ask questions and make comments? Uh, uh, Honorable George. Thank you. Thank you, a person. Um, thanks very much. Wait a bit. Honorable Peters, Honorable George, Honorable Shivambu, uh, Honorable Okam, uh, Murulong, uh, other vessels. Yes. Okay. Honorable uh, Peters. Thank, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, for your input. Um, my first question, Chairperson, is related to a long-standing debt that uh, the Zimbabwean Revenue uh, Agency owes South Africa, and uh, it is related to collecting southbound road uh, uh, tolls. Zimra indicated many years ago that um, the Ministry of Finance and Transport in South Africa does have the resources to pay back to, to SARS. And I just want to find out how far has SARS gone in collecting that money because I'm sure Honorable um, Maswala would also know about this. It is an outstanding indication that the money is there. But also the second question that person is related to a question that I would have wanted to ask the minister, but I can also ask the commissioner on whether he believes that the the, the number of grant recipients vis-a-vis -vis the uh, taxpayers will the system cope in terms of the grants that have been now advanced for the six months and those that have been uh, uh, increased uh, or um, you know, increased with the 250 or 500 rand uh, over for the COVID period. Uh, lastly, Chairperson, I just want to find out from uh, SARS, is the small businesses that are operating in the townships uh, registered for taxes? I'm raising this because the amount of money, if you take the 50 billion that has been given to social development, that 50 billion is probably a, a most of it spent in the township, in the park shops, and, um, and not, not just necessarily township, but uh, park shops, but the small businesses, especially those over operated by the foreign nationals. I just want to know whether these foreign nationals owned uh, shops are registered for taxes. Thank you very much. Thanks, Honorable Peters. Honorable George. Thank you, Chairperson. Thanks very much, Mr. Kisveta, for your presentation. Interesting as always. You mentioned the uh, issue with the cigarettes. Now, I mean, obviously, SARS has been battling for years with the illicit um, tobacco industry. And it's obviously very clear also, ask anybody really, that the black market in cigarettes is now thriving. Um, if anybody wants to get cigarettes, they certainly can. But broader than that is that because of the economy being opened up in sections, um, you know, they're obviously creating winners and losers. Now, what seems to be happening is that a parallel economy is starting to form. So that if, for example, you, a, a, a trader can't formally trade, and now starting to do, it, to do it outside of the system. 
So we actually are starting to develop a very big black market economy, it seems. And that will be all outside of the tax net. So is SARS doing anything into looking at that? Because, I mean, it is pretty clear that if you want to get a service, you can actually get it, even though regulations might not allow it. Of course, that is not legal. But in a system like that, the unintended consequence is that you're creating a very big, much bigger than before, informal economy that's outside the tax net. So I'd like your comment on that, please. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Honorable Judge. Honorable Shabam. Well, thank you, Chair. The, uh, I wanted to ask a question in relation to the estimated revenue loss, like, outside of the COVID-19 implications, like, because I'm sure that even prior to the pandemic and the lockdown, there were already indications that there's going to be massive revenue loss because of low or no economic growth or negative growth, which South Africa was going to experience. Are you able to quantify just how much revenue loss was going to occur even outside of a the COVID-19 implications. So we were able to separate the two issues because we shouldn't get to a situation where everything else is blamed on COVID-19 whilst there is structural incapacity of those who are mandated to engage in activities that is going to expand the productive sectors and therefore the economy of South Africa because I'm beginning to sense that a lot of people want to shift the blame to COVID-19 with this general incapacity and directionlessness that defines uh, 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 those who are mandated with uh, 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 growing the economy. The second question I want to ask is in relation to the digital economy that an obvious consequence of the lockdown will be a, a growing strength of the digital economy, e-commerce, and e-healing systems that happen. What is SARS plan or strategy in terms of revenue collection in those platforms? Because goods and services are being traded digitally, uh, digitally and, and uh, SARS collecting VAT then and, uh, and other taxes that are due to it in terms of uh, what, what, what the loss is and, and, and how much, like I collecting money from, from let's say Uber Eats later on, when it, it is fully fledged from Amazon, from all these uh, major digital uh, economic activities. And those are the few questions that uh, I wanted to raise. Uh, and I wanted to speak later on about uh, the approach on the surveillance of the government. I'm sure we'll engage about that on, on a subsequent uh, stage to say that everyone else has got the right to express their view in terms of what the Reserve Bank should do. And if they don't want to accept that it's their own issue, at least then the, the neoliberal lobby always sees that this is what the Reserve Bank should do. And, and there's no criminalization around that. So what is wrong with any person expressing perspective on what the Reserve Bank should do? And, and then they will decide whether they accept that or not and everything as an and, 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 and exit chair and conclusion is that I think that there can be a physically neutral mechanism to create a state bank currently if the nucleus of that bank will be the African bank because there's got some degree of uh, resource autonomy. Thank you, James. For a good presentation, it's effective that we do not have enough time to uh, drown it uh, in more detail. Uh, just a few things. You um, were saying on one of the slides that the employees from SARS are going to work from home. I just would like to find out whether the security around that has been sorted out. Uh, I think the public needs that assurance. Uh, on slide 19, you are talking about the quick, the slow, and the long effects on, on tax and the uh, uh, deficit that we are going to be building up. Obviously, it is of utmost importance to create as much tax income as possible. That is why I cannot understand some of the issues that we as uh, well, the government is not driving at the moment. Why uh, 
e-commerce is not allowed. Why the whole ban on cigarettes? I think, and I want to uh, add on to what uh, the Honorable George has said with regards to the illicit trading. I think what government is doing at the moment is making criminals out of normal law-abiding citizens. People that are cigarette smokers will go out and they will try to buy cigarettes from people. And at this stage, that is not legal. Government is losing money, and I think we are losing a lot of uh, law-abiding citizens that, that are losing respect for this government. I want to find out what you guys from SARS are going to do with regards to this matter. You are saying, saying in slide 20 that you are ensuring any considered efforts in syndicated fraud to, to, to clamp that down. And I think that is important. But are we talking about syndicates here? Only syndicates? Or are we talking about people that's got legal cigarettes, which they are going to pay tax on, but we are making criminals out of them at the moment? I think that should be addressed. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Honorable Morolo. Thanks, Honorable Oka. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Um, just a few brief questions. Uh, well, the first one is that uh, does the Commissioner hold a concern that more wealthy South Africans and corporations um, are transferring profits and wealth to uh, tax havens during this period? Um, beyond isolated incidents, uh, which uh, the Commissioner is mentioning of, uh, who whose purpose was to intercept illicit trading of uh, cigarettes and uh, alcohol. What are elaborate plans uh, that SARS has put in place uh, to try and curb the illegal sale of cigarettes and uh, alcohol? Um, last year there were reports that uh, uh, SARS was uh, falling behind uh, with its uh, IT systems. Um, I wanted to check whether there has been any improvements in this regard. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Thank you, uh, Chairperson, and thank you to uh, SARS for the uh, presentation. Um, I think the uh, three concerns raised by the Commissioner is spot on. And uh, government should take note of those concerns, especially with regard to the long-term effect. I think the key performance indicators of SARS are currently made impossible. And the legal term for that is the impossibility of performance of obligations. And that is what is currently happening. Um, the fact of the matter is that it will be impossible for SARS to reach its revenue collection targets and it will also be impossible for SARS to prevent illicit trade as this is made impossible by the current state and even though there were loopholes and certain shortcomings with regards to the illicit trade and illicit flow uh, prevention in the past the black market and the expansion of the illicit market now we cannot expect SARS to now control this efficiently because of these erratic regulations that is actually creating this situation. Chairperson, um, the long-term effect as well is of small businesses which are not receiving any assistance from government currently, and they in the past contributed to tax revenue, and they won't in the future be able to, um, to contribute to tax revenue. And the long-term effect is also as a result of the ideology of government to create and expand a welfare state where we have equality of poverty and no room for wealth creation. And that will have a long-term effect on our tax revenue and on everybody in South Africa because we won't be able to reach our obligations in terms of social welfare and so forth. And that uh, we government should take note of this presentation. Government should take note of the concerns raised by the revenue collector. Thanks, Honorable uh, uh, Then the last is Honorable uh, Lewis will take the response, Minister DG, Deputy Minister for Mission. Honorable Lewis. 
I just wanted to ask the minister in response to what he said, whether he is a member of this National Control Council or whatever it's called, because it operates, uh, it's very opaque uh, and, and vague in, in exactly who are members and, and what its powers are. So I would like to ask him if he is a member. Uh, and then to Commissioner Kispert, to thank you for a very interesting presentation uh, and a lot more contained in the presentation itself. But I just wanted to ask you very directly, the company that you referred to in your presentation that was caught manufacturing cigarettes, uh, is that company owned by uh, Adriano Mazzotti uh, or is he a shareholder in that company? Thank you. Thanks, uh, Louis, um, Honorable Minister, Deputy Minister, Commissioner DG, can we please respond? We only have uh, 15 minutes left. Uh, IT is putting pressure on us because there's supposed to be a meeting that is supposed to take place now. So they've just given us an allowance of another 15 minutes. Minister DG, Commissioner, Deputy Minister. Uh, can I ask the commissioner and the DG and so on if they want to say anything? I'll, I'll just round up. Thank you. Round up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I'll, I'll go quickly through the questions uh, from the Honorable Peters. Um, the money that she refers to is collected by the Crossroad uh, Cross Border Road Transit Agency. Uh, and not so. Uh, on the grant system, we are only helping uh, the department with our social development with data matching. We are not involved in the investment or the quantification of the grants. Uh, and then foreigners are equally required uh, to register for tax uh, uh, given the uh, economic activity as determined by the economic activity in South Africa. Um, to um, Honorable George, um, I mean, you, you are quite right in terms of the global economy. It is a real risk to give you in the month of April, customs are uh, made um, and to be cigarette marks and sending to the many of all Africa is a active member, but the two issues that requires convergence is the establishment of a new nexus, where previously or traditionally uh, the taxing rights is based on physical presence. The new nexus will be based on um, economic presence, whether it is physical or virtual. Um, and then I think the big debate uh, is around allocation principles, uh, which none of which have been resolved yet. Uh, to um, Honourable Okap. Um, on the security from work, we have, uh, firstly, uh, we do not allow the movement of any physical documents off-site uh, from staff premises. Um, and there are two modes of work. The one is emails um, uh, that uh, some staff would have access to. And then those staff who are required to get access to our core systems they can only come in via our virtual private network, which is a secure network. In terms of uh, e-commerce uh, um, there, basically, uh, we have obviously a big job together with the rest of our JCPS uh, colleagues um, to fight the, the scourge of, of criminal uh, activities. And we take a very hard line on non-compliance and criminal activities and the information I shared with you earlier about the work of our tactical uh, investigation unit uh, that focuses on that is out uh, that we do make an impact, but I would be the first to say that we need to improve our capacity uh, so that we can expand our impact uh, significantly more than currently doing. Uh, 
um, Ambom along. Tax havens, uh, we know, not tax havens so necessarily, but uh, South Africans have offshore financial assets. We know that there are more than 3.1 million of those uh, accounting for at least 15 billion euros. Uh, we have an uh, automatic exchange of information agreement with 93 countries and going, uh, and that allows us in conjunction with our local banks to have access to those uh, um, to those individuals and to ensure compliance. Um, we are currently setting up a separate INET with individual unit because we believe it warrants its own uh, capacity, and we are in the final stages of concluding work with uh, Judge Davis and the Davis Tax Committee uh, to establish the high risk areas um, of transfer pricing and other areas of abuse. Um, and so we will report on that uh, around about uh, the first half of, of uh, the second half of this year. Um, on board vessels, we completely agree with you. I have nothing else to add to your comments you've made. Um, and in terms of um, Honorable Hugh Lewis, uh, there suffice to say that uh, taxpayer confidentiality prohibits me from telling you who the individual company is, um, but I want to give you the assurance that we act without fear, favor, or prejudice. Uh, we are not, uh, we are going to in any regard for who the individual or individuals are. We will enforce and apply the law as we are required to do. I will pause there, um, Chair. Uh, thanks, uh, Commissioner, uh, DG, Deputy Minister, and Minister. No, thank you, Chair. I don't have anything to add. It was not a direct question to me. Thank you. Okay, Deputy Minister. No, I'm covered, Chair. I have nothing to add. Thank you. Pleasure. Minister, two minutes. Yes, when you're ab abandoned by your left hand, you know you're in trouble. Um, the, the issue of the grants, let me emphasize once again that uh, the additional grant amounts which have been provided are temporary, uh, meant to help cushion the burden that our people are carrying uh, during this, this period. The additional amount would come to an end in October. And I think it's very important that we jointly communicate a common message. The uh, sustainability, therefore, in a very uh, difficult tax environment is something we have looked at. There's a lot of reprioritization which has had to take place. Uh, and none of the departments or the ministers are going to appreciate the deep reductions which we are going to, to make in the supplementary budget. But we have tried as much as possible, by the way, Chair, to, to preserve the economic uh, uh, services uh, departments because uh, one of the best ways in which we can come out of this crisis is through uh, investment in economic uh, growth, uh, growth enhancing activities. As far as more business is concerned, let me just re emphasize what we have said before. Any business, large or small or micro, spaz or otherwise, which wants to operate in the Republic of South Africa must be registered. A, B, must have a license to operate. C, must have a banking account. And D, must open up space for health uh, inspectors to check the health status of the commodities that they, uh, they sell there. This approach has got both uh, uh, an economic uh, and, uh, tax implication, health implication, but also a security implication. We need to know who are those people who are operating in our townships and villages, the sponsor shops, in the shops. Who are they? Bagaman, Baumguin, Subongosabobamani, we don't know who they are, who are they, where do they come from. So I think we need to know that. Uh, and this should be supportive uh, of economic development. I suggest, Chair, that uh, this committee um, must once and for all make illegal the use of the concept black market. 
uh, it's a racial term. There's no black market. There's an underground market because there's no white market. There's no brown market. There's no uh, why should there be a black market? It's an illegal market or underground market. And I think the use of those words got to be careful. The last question directed at me was from uh, the Honorable Hill. Hill Lewis. I know he was going to be noted that one. I uh, must have gone to a private school. So the he says, yeah, am I a member of the National Coronavirus uh, Control uh, Command Council? The answer is yes, I am a member. That is a, a substructure of the cabinet. And the cabinet under the president is entitled to form any subcommittees to deal with specific matters. And this one clearly, in my reading of it, is an ad hoc committee uh, dealing specifically with issues uh, to do with the uh, COVID-19. Uh, it makes recommendations to the cabinet, and it is cabinet eventually that makes the final decision. So let's not confuse issues. And the president is entitled to form any ad hoc committees of the cabinet to fast check uh, the work of cabinet. Let me give an example. There's something called the the mean combat, the minister's committee on the budget. And Bishop, yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I is worried. Okay. I was saying there's something called the mean combat, the minister's committee on the budget as well, which processes the budget and reports to, to the cabinet. So these subcommittees are allowed from time to time. Thank you very much for your indulgence. And uh, thank you very much. Much appreciated. Thank you. Okay, Minister. Let me take the last two follow up questions and then uh, we close. Uh, Honorable uh, Abrams, Honorable Shabam, uh, one minute each, and I uh, have the Minister and the Commissioner responding. Honorable Abrams. Honorable Abrams, no, see, where are you? Okay, let me take on a bush bamboo in the meantime, and then uh, while we are looking for the background. Honorable bush bamboo. Now, quickly, I think that we should ask from SARS that he must give us a clear uh, plan on how are they going to collect the revenue from the digital economy, because the, the, we we'll raised this when we went to SARS as, a, as the standing community, and, and, and they seem to be working on it, working on it, and sort of OECD. They can we get a concrete report in that regard? Because inevitably, the, the economy is not going to be a brick and mortar economy. It has been shifting even outside of Corona. Now it is just going to be excited into a much more visual digital economy. And if you do not have mechanism to collect revenue maximally in that space, it means that you won't be able to collect revenue at all. So maybe that must give us a much more concrete, detailed update in terms of how are they going to collect revenue from uh, these spaces because they're going to dominate and it's not only international businesses that do so even the local retailers are now entering into that space and if there's no clear play in terms of revenue collection it means that the goods and products which we were pick and pay and uh, distribute on that platform of uber eats or whatever thing are not going to be the one going to collect in that space so mind uh, and detail the uh, plan and appraise on so that we know what is happening instead of an uh, almost dismissive attitude that you no know, one dealing with it or is it and this and that and so that uh, as if like the, 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 the no agency around so we need a quantity for up about that uh, and then we'll take it from there Honorable Abrams, are you there? Uh, Honorable Abrams. I'm here, can you hear me now? Yeah, make a quick question. Uh, I yes, I'm going to be very quick, oh. I'm, not, I'm not going to, make a, uh, to ask a question per se. I am fully behind the minister in terms of the principles around the banning and unbanning of um, cigarettes due to the reasons that were uh, presented by the, the commissioner. But I'm not on that uh, for today. I'm just in process. I just want us to quickly adopt the presentations 
as we note that the, the, the special tabling of uh, the appropriation uh, bill in July, we, we have some changes, but we will receive those thereafter. But I just wanted to ensure that we, we, we adopt the presentation for now. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks uh, very much. Uh, a move on for adoption. Any second? Second it. Is it Honorable Peter? Yes, Chairperson. A second Honorable Peter's <laughs> proposal that we adopt the presentations, both of them. <laughs> what capacity are we adopting them? What capacity is this? In this uh, joint committee, is there a, a legislated background and foundation for such or rules that say we must adopt a report? Are we not supposed to, uh, as uh, it has to be, a, if it was under normal circumstances, was it not supposed to be ATC then follow all those processes? You know, the, the third committee on finance as a separate meeting. Like, I, I put, the chief whips would have briefed all of us in terms of what is the required process. The standing committee on finance must meet separately, not just a combination of things. It has never been such a discipline. You must remember that the rules of parliament are not suspended in this period. We're working within the rules of parliament. Yes. Uh, may I come in, it's Eunice. Okay. Firstly, uh, as I understand it, uh, we don't want to adopt a report from the executive. We only consider a report from the executive. We do our own report on what we think are key issues that derive from the discussion today and our responses in particular to what the executive has said. That report is then submitted uh, to the committee to adopt, and there usually is a debate on it. So we can't adopt the executive's presentation. We have to get a draft report from the committee staff and chairperson process, it is normal. Secondly, yes, Mr. Shivam was right. We have raised this with the NCOP. Normally, the finance committee is not involved in this process, but we were told in view of the situation, uh, we should get engaged. So we are discussing with the powers that be, what do we do? We adopt a joint report, I think it's unlikely. We should adopt separate reports, and we will deal with that as we deal with in terms of the rules. Often you have joint meetings with separate reports. I don't think Mr. Shivamu's issue is not covered. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much uh, for clarifying. Uh, let's come to the last uh, item. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Minister, Deputy Minister Tichi, honorable members. Uh, let me just come in on one item of uh, text. Uh, because I hear there is a lot of emphasis on uh, cigarettes or uh, exercise uh, uh, duties. If you look at uh, the breakdown of uh, revenue in the past uh, three financial years, uh, the biggest contributor to revenue is personal income tax at 38.3%. Uh, uh, followed by VAT at 25.2%. Uh, uh, number three is corporate tax, income tax at 16.6%. Uh, fuel levy comes at four at 5.9%. Uh, and uh, custom duties is at 4.3%, uh, number five. And uh, excise, specific excise, which is alcohol and uh, cigarettes, it stands at 3.2%. Uh, uh, and within the category of uh, excise duties, which is alcohol and cigarettes, here is uh, it's at 13.7%, uh, and cigarettes is at 12.4%. So I wonder us that when we discuss whether cigarette is the highest contributor of tax, we should affect. It is not. CIG is the highest, and as I've said, within the category of exercise, still beer comes first than cigarette. 
So we should not discuss because we are influenced by the business lobby or by the uh, lobby from somewhere else. And within these categories, uh, there are a number of uh, business activities which are in suspension as a result of lockdown. So if you are in the lobby of uh, uh, cigarettes, you have to put a very strong case. Why should not we? I mean, why should government not release uh, uplift restrictions on the items or on the categories which are the highest in terms of uh, contribution to tax? So let's not just be emotional uh, or advance to be from somewhere. Let's be focused on the effects which are there in regard to the breakdown. So also, Minister. In the light of uh, uh, lockdown and uh, the impact of this pandemic, obviously the global and the national economy is going to be impacted very heavily. And as a result, as a country, we have to position ourselves within that uh, reconfigured global economy because we risk to find ourselves out there in the periphery. Already we have seen uh, the, the impact of the pandemic. What was happening at the Oliven in Centurion, where there has been so many people, thousands of people who were queuing for the food parcels, it shows us the impact uh, of pandemic in Tohanga, uh, poverty, joblessness. And if the situation continues as we have witnessed in Oliven and other areas, it means in three months' time, the situation will be uh, far much worse than what we have. So what calls upon that uh, the state plan as presented by now might have to be seriously relooked at and come with the plans that you presented last week and the structural reform that you have reminded us about today to make sure that uh, we intervene in regard to the issues of hunger, poverty, unemployment, and businesses which are, are going to close. And I should indicate, as you have correctly put it, uh, lockdown does not mean the suspension of the constitution, policies of government, and legislation, more especially when it has to deal with transformation. I don't think we have uh, a government that suspended economic transformation, empowerment of women, uh, you, uh, blacks in general, and Africans in particular. I don't think we have reached a stage where we say lockdown have suspended those policies. We remain a constitutional democracy, and the policies and legislations have to be implemented as adopted. Thanks very much, uh, honorable members. Uh, we'll meet again as the uh, uh, committees to uh, consider the reports. Uh, which will be officially adopted. Uh, thanks, uh, members. Uh, the meeting is ahead. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, uh, Deputy Minister.